processes that take place that allow for the voices of the different uh, stakeholders and critical stakeholders from different constituencies as they engage in the governance processes. And I thought, and I think very quickly, I'd just like to also set uh, the parameters of uh, this uh, discussion that's going to ensue. The cooperation, the context in which we will be engaging in discussions today is within the broader global governance uh, mechanisms. So we're not talking about internal processes within internet organizations such as uh, internal processes within ICANN or internal processes within ISOC and that sort of thing. What we're talking about is collaborative, uh, uh, collaborative cross-constituency processes where represent representation and selection processes are made towards, um, towards committees and that sort of thing. Things like the UN DESA, things like the MEG. So with that, um, I'd like to invite Constance Bermelea from the technical community who will be giving, who will be sharing her thoughts. Constance? Thank you very much. Um, so I'll, I'll just start by giving uh, some information on, on, on the context of the, the discussion here. Um, since WSIS ISOC uh, has been asked to uh, serve as a focal point for various uh, nomination processes, and uh, this has been uh, used for uh, the renewal of the MAG, for instance, or several uh, working groups of the UN uh, CSTD, the, the Commission on Science, Technology, and, and Development. To facilitate uh, discussions around internet governance and our various uh, nomination processes, we have a mailing list. Uh, it's called the Internet Collaboration uh, Mailing List. And we also organize monthly calls uh, to exchange in a very informal way on our various activities, insights, uh, thoughts. Um, and uh, when useful, we, we use this group and this, this platform uh, to identify representatives of the technical community for these, these various purposes, uh, finding uh, individuals, good experts, to feed the MAG or various working groups. Um, you said we wouldn't go in, in, into a lot of details on, on these nomination processes, but uh, I think it's still worth, uh, you know, very briefly saying that in, in the example of the CSTD Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation, for instance, uh, in a very simple way, we share uh, the call, the opportunity, uh, with our mailing list, with our, with our communities. Uh, we ask for names um, with, uh, with relevant information, bi biographies, etc. And then we have a call, several calls if necessary. We come up with a short list. Um, and then final names are, are suggested, uh, put forward to the relevant uh, intergovernmental bodies, because usually it's, it's, uh, it's for the IGF or for the CSTD, um, acknowledging that the decision, of course, is taken by those, uh, those, relevant, those relevant bodies. Before going further, I would, I would just like to um, uh, shed some light on, on what for me seems to be a paradox. Um, the technical community by nature is informal. Uh, when the technical community gathers uh, within the IETF, it is uh, an informal group of individuals and organizations who work on a specific task at a, at a specific moment. And the paradox is that um, as all these multi-stakeholder uh, processes have, have developed, when uh, we are asked to designate representatives uh, of our community um, to, uh, to feed these processes, we are asked to define very precisely who we are, to fit through the door. And that is really a paradox uh, on which we, 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 have to, we have to work, of course. Um, so I, I think it's fair to say that there are some gray zones. Uh, many individuals who are recognized uh, as being part of one community uh, may have connections, interest in other communities. And I guess this is where the notion of community has all its importance. Our various uh, groups uh, of stakeholders are united around a set of values, interests, um, uh, specific uh, uh, working items, um, and um, 
again, I think this notion of community being recognized as being uh, part of one group um, uh, shows that there is a societal uh, aspect to, uh, to, to the evolution and the definition of these, uh, these various groups. Uh, in short, there is no legal definition of, of our various groups. Um, furthermore, I would also um, note that um, these various groups that have evolved and, and, and developed uh, since WISIS, um, none of them can really intend to represent uh, the, 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 the entire groups uh, they, they, they come from. Uh, the Internet Collaboration Group, for instance, could not uh, intend, could not affirm that it represents the, the entire technical community. I don't think, uh, I'm not from the IGC, but I, I don't think the IGC, for instance, could affirm that it represents uh, the entire uh, civil society here. And this is why it's also very important to recognize that uh, no one has the monopoly of feeding multi-stakeholder processes. Uh, and it's probably very good to have competition between various groups. Um, the Internet Collaboration Group, uh, I consider it as a core group, an informal core group. Um, if individuals or organizations uh, feel that they are part of the technical community and wish to put their name forward directly uh, by contacting uh, you know, the UN or, or, or various intergovernmental uh, bodies, I think that should be possible. The Internet Collaboration Group, in my view, is there to facilitate discussion among a specific group, uh, but it certainly cannot uh, intend to represent the entire technical community. And I, I will conclude uh, before George um, uh, um, that the Internet Collaboration Group really is committed to uh, furthering, amplifying multi-stakeholder processes. Many of our organizations, many of the individuals that are part of our community uh, support uh, in their own capacity or through the organizations they work for, fellowships, ambassadorships, um, the IGF ambassadorship uh, that is run by the Internet Society is, is one example. I know there are many other organizations and individuals who help uh, the development of such processes uh, in, in our community, but, but also in, in other communities. So I'll, I'll stop there and see if um, George would like to add uh, to what I've said, and I'm, I'm sure I've forgotten many, many details. No, you haven't. It's a very, a very good summary of, uh, of where we are and what we do. Uh, I'd like to add some thoughts. Uh, some of them are very similar to what Constance has said. There are maybe some new things involved. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, even though I'm affiliated with ICANN, I'm speaking in my individual capacity here. So the, the first thing to ask uh, that I ask is, what is the Internet technical community? And the community is a slippery word. It can mean many different things to many different people. Um, uh, but starting, uh, let's say that everybody who's involved in the uh, direct administration, development, operation, uh, care and feeding of the Internet is in that c community. And that's a big community. Uh, uh, my uh, off-the-cuff estimate is about 2 million people. Uh, it could be less, it could be more. It depends on which, how you estimate. Uh, how many of those are non-trivially aware of Internet governance issues is a much smaller group. Uh, maybe it's 10,000. Uh, and maybe it's more after the uh, NSA and related disclosures. Uh, how many of those are interested in really understanding and staying informed in some detail? Uh, maybe it's 200, maybe more. Um, and how many of those want to participate really actively in Internet governance? Uh, well, 50, maybe more. I don't know. But uh, this, this is what we see uh, when we uh, talk about Internet governance. Uh, the technical community is self-identifying. Uh, uh, you, you can't just join it. Uh, you join by establishing a track record, a technical track record within the community, uh, which is different from some other communities where you, where you join because you have an interest and you want to learn and you're recognized as a member uh, immediately. The community is open, but um, the recognition of membership in it is based on accomplish accomplishments. So the next question I asked was, uh, what should the goals of the technical community be with respect to Internet governance decisions? Uh, and discussions. And, and uh, I think it's to provide useful and accurate technical advice 
regarding possible technical mechanisms that affect internet governance and to inform the larger community, the multi-sectoral or the multi-stakeholder community regarding the implications of actual or proposed uh, decisions uh, or by other actors or by the group as a whole. Now, it, I think it's important to uh, recognize the difference, as Constance has said, uh, between the interests of the people in the technical community and what we think the technical community should be giving uh, to these discussions. Uh, people in the community have different interests. Um, I take myself as an example. I've been an independent entrepreneur. I've worked for governments. Uh, I've run civil society organizations, but I consider myself technical. Uh, the, uh, if I represent the technical community, I will be informed of, uh, in my experience by all these things, but I will, I think I should keep the advice to the technical advice and how it affects the discussions. And I think that's a, dis uh, a, a, a difference that sometimes gets blurred when we think about what the uh, representatives of the various communities should be providing. Now, not everybody is um, uh, in agreement with that definition. And uh, if you'd like to discuss it further, uh, Workshop 210, uh, the role of the technical community in Internet governance is going to drill down to this topic a little bit more. It's Thursday at 2.30 p.m. So how do we select uh, people to represent the community in multi-stakeholder discussions in, uh, outside of the technical community? Uh, I start with the premise that uh, each stakeholder group has its own culture, its own processes, uh, Private sector uh, certainly operates differently than government, and uh, they do operate differently from civil society. And these, uh, uh, the cultures reflect the history uh, and the particular substance, in our case, technical substance, underlying the group. Um, and I think one of the ways in which we can cooperate best in this regard is uh, to say that we respect the processes and the guidelines and the policies of other groups because they know what they're doing in those in those sectors, and uh, uh, it, we expect uh, our processes and our guidelines to be respected in the same way uh, by the other groups. So there will be differences, and there should be differences because we're not all coming from the same place, and we don't all have the, we don't have a hundred percent shared experiences or goals. Uh, the internet technical sector has some very specific cultural characteristics. It's an open community. It, it regards technical excellence as primary in terms of what it does and, uh, and how it uses its skills. Uh, the Internet was born in a, in a research environment, and so research and teaching, research and learning, sharing and collaboration, the creation of things that work, software, hardware, processes, uh, is, uh, are, are very important values in our culture. Um, they're embodied in the IETF culture, which... Um, uh, is a meritocracy. Uh, it's uh, run by uh, people who, who uh, understand excellence and recognize it, and at the same time recognize lack of excellence. Uh, they are uh, uh, concerned with operational proof of what they do, running code, and they have a, a method of uh, making decisions which is not shared, uh, I think, uh, uh, in many places, rough consensus. Um, and rough consensus is an interesting concept because you, you, you sort of intuitively know what it means, but uh, it, it is capable of further study. And there's a paper, uh, a recent internet draft by uh, Pete Resnick, uh, which is uh, fairly long and it gives a nuanced and insightful analysis of how the EAT, IETF regards uh, uh, rough consensus. And I think it's worth reading if there's any interest in uh, knowing more about that. In terms of selection principles, uh, our concern is that the person we choose has the appropriate knowledge, either technical excellence or strongly connected to that community that has technical excellence uh, that supports that issue. And the principles that qualify our representatives um, are independence, uh, belonging to the community, transparency, participation, technical relevance, and uh, ability to collaborate, and those are principles that uh, uh, that we can go into more later if you like, but uh, the, those are the ones that we see as being really important uh, for judging who we would like to have represent us in uh, um, a multi-stakeholder forum. The choice is discussed and made 
by a small self-selected group of the technical community. Uh, as Constance said, we don't claim to represent the technical community, but we also know that the technical community, those who care, and even those who don't, uh, know what we're doing and can, on the basis of their, uh, of their background, they can, um, they can come and be a part of us. Uh, if, they, if they don't like the way we're doing things, they, they will join us and they will tell us so. Uh, the group that's choosing is open. It's based on expertise, interest, and understanding of the issues. Uh, the rough consensus principle is used uh, to come to a decision. Um, well, finally, I'd like to say that the, the group and process are presently coordinated by ISOC by mutual consent, uh, but the group is neither dependent upon or uh, reports in any formal sense to ISOC. Uh, we had hoped to have a uh, short paper uh, which describes these processes and guidelines in somewhat more uh, detail and in a somewhat more crisper manner. Uh, we're, we're not quite ready for that yet. Uh, we just weren't able to pull it together, but we are working on it. And uh, uh, even when it is published, we understand and, and state that the process and the criteria uh, are going to evolve, and they're going to evolve in response to our thinking about things and in response to the evolving situation in Internet governance and the evolving needs of the uh, multi-stakeholder gatherings of, to which we will be providing representatives. Thank you. Before we hear from civil society, a quick synthesis of um, what uh, both Constance and George uh, sort of um, addressed, what they, what they raised, was we're hearing that different stakeholder groups have different mechanisms for selection. The other thing was um, the issue of definitions in terms of defining communities. Uh, the other thing that we're hearing is um, criteria, the issue of criteria of selection, for selection. So with that, we're going to hear from uh, civil society. And um, we'll have uh, Amriet Estrusion ad address us. Does someone know how to turn the air conditioning down? Please, if possible, um, because it, I, mean, I think I'm getting frostbite on my ears. It might be back here as well. Anyway, thanks. So now, um, I was preparing to speak specifically about the CFTD process. I think that was the plan. Was it not so it's okay for me to do that? But I will make a few general remarks. This echo here. Um, I think selection process in civil society is really um, complicated. Um, I think it's always quite complicated, but I think in civil society, particularly in the IG sector, because unlike with business, and with uh, the technical community, even though they are diverse within themselves, within the IGF context, they've evolved in a way where they've had appointed um, institutions that have been playing a facilitated role, so ISOC and ICC bases. And I'm sure not everyone in the technical community and business considers that legitimate, but there's a, there's a, a general consensus within those communities that those are legitimate institutions and that they do a job that most people respect. In civil society, we've never had that degree of organization and we have spaces where we have discussions, such as the Internet Governance Caucus, um, but they've never been established as structures. That, 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 that can represent us. So, and I think, so that's the one reason. And then I think also that with the goals, while, while civil society goals, I think are generally quite common. And the different solutions that people in civil society propose or believe in vary enormously. And I'll just mention one example, and that is regulate the internet or not. So I think everyone in civil society will say we believe in, it, in an internet for common good, but some people will have a very libertarian, no regulation uh, solution to achieve that goal or path to that goal, and others believe there needs to be more laws, regulation, checks and balances, and so on, and in between there's a spectrum. So it's actually very difficult. Um, and then I think the other complexity for civil society is resources. Uh, there's, there's, I know that 
all um, IJF participants and struggle uh, to have those also to participate. But I think with business and technical community, there's probably more of an overlap between people that have the interest and the capacity to participate in these processes and institutions that might or well, it might be in line with their work. So I, mean, I, I don't want to make generalization because I know from the African um, sector that the, that everyone in Africa, small businesses as well, and many people in the tech, tech community don't have the resources. And then I think the issue of power. I think I think that within our IGF and and uh, our Internet Governance Universe. I think that the tech community and business have been more effective in establishing their power and influence in a consistent way. And, and you might see it very differently. But uh, from my perspective, as someone in civil society, I think civil society has not been as organized, not as coherent, um, not as consistent. And therefore, our power and influence has tended to to wax and wane. It, it, it comes and goes, and it depends on the issue and the moment and the event. And what this does is that it creates a certain sense of, or a certain degree of tension um, among civil society, and this tension plays itself out often when there's a selection process. And the issue of, of you know, the other issue is that you have the civil society spaces are made up of a mix of individuals, academics, organizations, and we generally work in a very open and inclusive way, but when it comes to selection processes, that's more complex. In the caucus, the IGC, um, very um, transparent procedures have been developed for selecting representatives of the IGC caucus. There's, there's a non-com process, but many people in civil society, I would say most, would not feel that the IGC caucus is the representative body for, for all of civil society. So even though RGC has made all this progress in establishing transparent and effective, accountable procedures, with um, um, there's even a, not a grievance, what do we call it? It's not a, there's a, an appeals, appeals procedure. There's an appeals team. So the procedures are really sound, but it doesn't represent all of civil society. Okay, so to get to the CSTD, um, I was asked um, by the chair of the CSTD to um, facilitate the selection process of the representatives to the working group on enhanced cooperation. And because of all the reasons that I've just mentioned, um, I felt that I needed to establish a fresh process. I felt I needed to take responsibility for it. I didn't feel it would be appropriate for me to delegate it to the IGC or to anyone else for that matter um, because I thought that would actually make it even more difficult. And, and the, you know, the, 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 the methodology I used was essentially very similar to any other selection process or a hiring process. I convened a selection group drawing on individuals that have been active in um, civil society, in, in the internet governance context, that was regionally representative. So I had somebody from um, each of the, you know, the main regions that we all work in, continents. <laughs> then um, this group, I had to brief in a very short space of time and get their the buy-in. <laughs> we had Africa, Asia, North America, Latin America, Europe, and then to complement that group, I invited two past IGC coordinators. And the reason why I thought this was necessary was not just because of the IGC, but the IGC had already done its own selection process by that time for the CSTD working group. And I felt that to show some respect for that selection process without just adopting it wholesale, it would be appropriate. To, to have two past IGC coordinators. So, so just to show respect for that structure. So this, I guess, is just balancing interest and trying to, to build more ownership in the process. Um, and then um, to avoid conflict of interest, I did not include anyone from APC in the selection committee because APC is quite a large network and so there are a lot of APC people in this community but I felt it would be inappropriate for me to include anyone from APC. 
And basically from then it was a question of um, inviting nominations and um, criteria. I had to develop a specific device for dealing with endorsed um, nominees. People that had been, some people would send in their nomination with 50 endorsements or 50 other people having endorsed them. Some would just send a nomination of one person. And, um, and having discussed that as well with the selection group and others, and we noted if anyone had been endorsed. But we felt, seeing as it was not a criteria, it would not be appropriate to give additional weighting to people who had received endorsements. And, um, and then the criteria were experience and expertise in public interest-oriented policy processes. Experience and expertise in enhanced cooperation um, in relation to WISIS and IG, ability and commitment to put in the work and travel, ability to work collaboratively and confidently in multi-stakeholder processes that involve both consensus building and dealing with conflicting interest. And then we um, allowed for regional and um, gender balance. So the process was quite complicated. The poor collection committee had to work quite hard. Nana was there, she knows. <laughs> and uh, because we had, we had several scoring processes, we had a short list, and then out of the short list, um, we scored again. Um, all in all, I, I, I feel happy with that particular process, and I think it has some people question the legitimacy, and I think um, even though it was a very transparent process, there were still people that questioned the legitimacy, but I felt that I had, um, and with the help of the, the selection committee, um, a process that I could respond to them with. So there was a procedure, it was pretty transparent, because I think it is okay for people to question these processes. I think they need to be questioned in a respectful way, but it is legitimate to question them. And, and I had prepared and I had anticipated that it might be. I think in, 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 um, just in, in retrospect, actually I'll come back to that, because having reflected on this process, there's some additional criteria that I think should be applied, and also criteria on assessing whether people that have been selected even you know, through a process like this, are actually delivering, are they doing the work? And I would like us to have, particularly with processes like the MAG, um, to have a mechanism where we can remove people um, if they don't deliver or participate before the next round of rotation comes up. But I'll come back to that later. That was just the story of the, of the CSTD process. Thank you, Henriette. And just before I give this um, over to uh, Norbert, we, we just listened to a practical uh, selection process and uh, the evolution of uh, that particular selection process within civil society. Norbert Bello, please. Okay, quickly to introduce myself, I'm together with Salanieta, who is moderating this meeting, the other co coordinator of the Internet Governance Caucus. And sometimes I joke that I'm wearing the coordinator hat when I speak officially, but now I just speak in my personal capacity, just giving a perspective. Um, personally, I like to think, and especially when we want to look forward and find solutions that may have some sustainability, I like to think about the reason for things. Now, it's easy for me to see why the technical community has a lot of credibility in this space. Essentially, they build it, they know it, they can tell us how it works. It's easy to see why the business community has credibility, or at least why I would um, assign cre credibility. This is something that everybody that's more or less personally, because they are in the position through having a significant customer base to be part of the solution. When we have problems, and we have lots of them in Internet governance, we need to have the entities involved that can actually make change happen. Different, of course, are governments, but in this 
we also have power to make change happen. So now here come we, civil society people, and we claim that we should be totally respected. But why? What is the basis for our claim? And I think the real basis for this claim is that we can claim independence. Power is uh, something valuable, but it also comes with its interests. And in order to be respected, I would say we as civil society need to maintain independence from such power in order to be respected as civil society. So this is, in a way, a core criterion if we want to be representing civil society, we should make sure that we are actually credibly able to represent the people whom we claim to represent and not, uh, yeah, not be too influenced by some kind of monetary or political interest that we might care about. Well, the easiest way to solve this problem is simply for everybody to come in and represent their own interests. That is totally unproblematic in a way, except that not everybody takes the time to come here, not everybody is able to, and except that in some contexts, like the CSDT working group, they are simply not accepting everybody to come. So there must be a selection process with credibility that figures out a small number of people, we only have a small number of representatives there in civil society, who will represent civil society. So somehow this would be my first principle in this selection process. It must ensure that these people who get selected are actually independent of political and business power. The second principle that I was, would propose specifically for civil society has to do with what was already mentioned several times. There is not a single entity that can claim to be totally representative. What is the point of the Internet Governance Caucus selecting some people from just the relatively small part of civil society that is organized in the caucus, and everybody else will feel unrepresented. So I would propose this fundamental idea of a norm com of a nomination commission is good, but it must not, if it, the goal is to represent civil society as a whole, it must not be a commission of the Internet Governance Caucus, but I would propose it must be a joint norm com where all civil society people are equally able to put their names forward to become part of the NOMCOM. I quickly summarize how this works. The, in the nomination commission process, the NOMCOM process, we, get, we ask many people to volunteer to be part of this commission, and the actual members of the commission are then randomly selected. It works surprisingly well. These random people, they then discuss criteria, they make a call for interest, and people who want to be selected, they put forward their names, the reasons why they would consider themselves to be viable candidates, and then the nomination commission, they decide, and in the end they de decide. They discuss, they decide, possibly by voting. The big difference that I would propose, it must be a joint thing. It must not be a thing of the caucus or of some other entity. But this will be something, in my opinion, that we need to organize in civil society, including the major groups, which is APC. Now there's another rising star called Best Bits. And there are many, 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 many civil society people. The vast majority is not part of any of these networks. So a joint nomination commission would really need to reach out to this huge community. And then 
of course, to make this credible, to make it trustworthy, we must have accountability, we must have transparency. But I think I'll stop here for now, and in the discussion then we can perhaps find more joint principles how to actually make this accountability and transparency work. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert. Uh, at this point, I'd just like to mention that there's actually a working document uh, that's already uh, been passed around. It's uh, probably hosted on the website already, I'm not sure, but we'll check after this. And I just wanted to point out that there will be a drafting uh, process, and members, of those who are here in the room are invited to be part of that process, where you can actually give your feedback, where we encourage uh, the solicitation of uh, a diverse perspectives on the issue, on the issues uh, that are raised. And yes, uh, this invitation is also open to those who are remotely participating. I'd just like to very quickly synthesize um, the voice of civil society here on this panel, just to tease out two critical uh, points. One was um, whether there's need for aggregating the voice of civil society pertaining to a potential NOMCOM uh, with these, uh, in terms of the selection processes, incre increasing and enhancing uh, accountability and transparency. Again, we don't know how that's going to look. These are just um, what we're hearing from Norbert. And, um, and also pertaining to the issue of criteria. And we've, we're hearing this from the technical community. We're hearing it again from within civil society, the issue of criteria and their diverse uh, conflicting perspectives even uh, within that category. And with that, I would just like to um, uh, welcome uh, Aisha Hassan, who will be uh, addressing us on um, from the business focal point in terms of their selection processes and uh, multi-stakeholder selection processes in terms of and accountability and transparency. Aisha. Thank you very much, Sala, um, and thank you to the other panelists because I think there's some really interesting common areas that are coming out, both in terms of criteria and approaches as well as challenges. Um, yes, yeah, so Aisha Hassan on behalf of ICC Basis. Uh, the International Chamber of Commerce back during the summit was asked to be the sole focal point for business. So during the summit, it was we set up an umbrella called the Coordinating Committee of Business Interlocutors, CCBI, and that was the sole accreditation, accreditation mechanism for any business that wanted to uh, be a part of the summit preparations and be at the summit. At the end of the summit, um, when these various processes were established, IGF, the CSTDs, follow-up, etc., uh, we launched the BASIS initiative as a call that as our members and business that was involved in the summit uh, wanted to have a coordinating representational advocacy platform for business to help them organize themselves to be able to bring the expertise of business into the IGF and, and other, uh, other processes. So BASIS is basically that. It's a platform that provides those services but also serves as the focal point vis-a-vis uh, the multi-stakeholder advisory group, the various CSTD working groups, etc., to provide business experts for those uh, those groups. Um, over the process, over the past years, we've evolved our process for selection, and I wanted to underscore that though we, as ICC basis, do put forward proposals for these various groups, the MAG, etc. There are examples where business representatives have been appointed through other channels. But because of the credibility that has been established, uh, the fact that ICC basis's membership, but also our networks, because the membership includes uh, various other business associations, WITSA, AFICTA, etc., and those associations have networks that are regional or sector specific. So when we start our process to select and identify uh, potential members, we're going out to our national committees in 120 countries, to the members of our Digital Economy Commission, which is over 300 uh, members, to the networks of the various associations that are affiliated with ICC basis, and asking them as a first step 
to send in names, identify people, and that once we have the names, we go through a similar process that has been described by the others. Uh, we put out the whole list of names with short bios to our basis membership. Uh, they prioritize those names and tell us if we need to fill, fill eight seats, they prioritize one to eight or whatever the number might be. We usually take a couple of rounds that includes both email input as well as um, teleconferences to discuss the, the group that has been put forward. Um, my colleague Constance Weiss is in the, the room as well. She helps to compile the numbers. And once we've gotten to a solid base, that is the list that goes in. Um, in terms of criteria, I mean, I would say qualities. What we're looking for are many things that I've heard from the other panelists as well. Uh, first off, we're looking for somebody who has experience with the processes and expertise, that they're going to bring a sector-specific or geographic-specific spe perspective, business perspective. Um, we also are looking for people who are actively engaged. This is, these processes are, are complicated, and it makes it easier if somebody has some, some exposure to them already. Uh, somebody who's actively willing to collaborate, a willingness to work with others across st stakeholder groups. Um, and as Amiette pointed out, over the years it's become more and more really a, a, a major criteria for us that people can commit to the travel, to the work, are willing to also keep the business community updated on what's going on as they, they serve as our representatives. Um, and we've also made attempts to, to the extent possible, uh, have diversity of geographic and, and, and gender diversity. Um, and I would also just comment that the geographic diversity issue, uh, we, we are challenged to ensure that developing country business participants have the resources and support to uh, perform their duties in these working groups and it, it, it affects them um, as much as anyone else from other stakeholder groups. Um, I would also say that as George has said, the, the different stakeholder groups have different cultures. Uh, from a business perspective, there is a desire for there to be an easy, effective, efficient way for these kinds of selection processes to happen and people have felt comfortable with ICC basis. That doesn't that again doesn't mean that there aren't business people out there who participate in these processes who are not part of this group. Um, but we do provide a, a, a useful focal point for business. So with that, I, I'll stop. And I hope that that describes the process. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ayesha. We're going to hear from um, Mr. Virat Bhatia from AT&T India. Um, thank you. I, um, I also chair an um, industry association um, in Delhi, the, the largest industry association out of India, which has about 150 um, representatives in the various ICT spaces which work um, in this umbrella body. Um, and as we see this whole process of multi-stakeholder selection, I can sort of come back to two um, ex experiments that we've tried in the last um, two years. Um, we started off domestically with a um, India Internet Governance Conference, which is a um, governance initiative uh, for the first time after India had hosted the IGF in 2008. Um, usually it isn't up to the private sector to sort of get this movement going, um, but we did. It was originally planned out to be an internet broadband conference and we sort of extended it to include many of the governance agendas, but that also meant expanding who would participate and what events will be arranged and what sessions will be arranged. So that meant then calling in everyone that we knew um, to participate in that process. And these were both established names and some not so established names from various dif different backgrounds. Um, anybody who tries to put together a coalition of multi-stakeholders, let me tell you, it's not easy. 
it's never complete and no one is ever happy. Um, but um, for me it was a very rewarding and a tiring experience for a simple reason that we are not coached and trained to deal with um, multi-stakeholder groups in a dialogue that spends 80% of the time in process and 20% time on results. The business community is trained to dealing with about 10% on process and then gets on to the results. The business community is also inherently trained to very quickly um, find a coalition, find a leader, find common issues and get behind it. And they're also trained because they advocate all the time with the government in an organized way to quickly leave out the other issues. This was not what we experienced when we put together the selection process for the multi-stakeholders. Um, so in the first instance, it was by invitation, people we knew and we expanded it, but we made sure that there was adequate representation from all the stakeholder groups and 25% of them were women. This was in year one, which is uh, to the Westerners in my strike is normal. It's not a normal um, number for the developing world, certainly not for India, um, to have that level of participation. Uh, in the next year, uh, we changed the process, and um, selection process was um, open, quite close to what we have in the IGF, which is self-nomination based on who you represent. And we got 49 people who wanted to serve on the National MAG. Um, of the 49 who put in their application to serve on the National MAG, everybody was selected. Um, in the end, only about 30 participate actively. But um, the MAG in the second year, unlike the first year, which was slightly business heavy, was equally distributed amongst business civil society, um, technical community, media, academia, and youth. Reasonably equally divided. But uh, what was heartening was that the numbers moved to 36% for women from 25% in the first year. Now, we've had to hold off that process because the government had gone ahead and announced um, a MAG and wants to hold an India IGF, so this would seem like it's a competing event which we don't want to do. But in my experience, uh, based on the uh, first-hand experience that we've had of um, selecting this, it was quite clear that these um, individuals who represented this, some of them represented large sections of NGOs, academia, some were in their personal capacity but were individual experts. So there wasn't a hard and fast rule. Uh, we were able to get away with sort of nominating um, uh, sorry, oh, making it a nomination, safe nomination. Uh, but I think as you go forward, um, criteria will have to be drawn. Now, the government has set up a mag, and that's also top-down nomination by the government. Our expectation is that they will expand that to further include people who are not there. Um, but I think um, the accountability of such a process, which is an initial year, comes from the results that you delivered. So while the first year was a process of calling everybody that you knew to come participate, and the second one was an open nomination, you'd be glad to know that while the funding came voluntarily, 100% from the private sector, 90% of the sessions were organized by the civil society at the academia. And in the second year, 95% of the sessions were being organized by the civil society and the academia, and 50% of the sessions were being led by women. So the whole um, constituency was quite different in terms of accountability and where it came. So I just wanted to make the distinction between um, processes of selection and the outcomes, wherein um, it's, it's unclear to me if we had adopted a different process than what we did. Uh, we would have got that. But that's just a country experience. I think it's an evolving um, experience. You also sort of pleased to know that some 400 people participated in it, which made it one of the largest 
internet governance conferences. We don't call it IGF because it isn't the IGF will be launched at some stage by the government in the future. I will just make one comment. I think the group that we found um, least coherent among the lot on what they wanted were actually the civil society. Um, they were um, least structured in terms of what they wanted and how they wanted the process to go. The academicians were very clear what they needed. They were ready. The industry, as I told you, the business, the government, even the youth, when we asked them to select a coalition leader, they took about seven minutes in a room, came back and said, by rotation, six months, this person, six months, this person. And they were up to the leader. The civil society could not pick anybody for a long time. And that was the challenge, which was, uh, you know, whatever the reasons, but I just wanted to sort of present that point. But there have been a huge help in structuring the discussion, the debates, because they really brought in the real issues. So there's a very positive side to this difficult process, but I thought I'd just mention that. Thank you. That was really awesome. The common threads uh, you would have heard from the different uh, panelists, and um, essentially one of the threads is criteria, issue of, the, of criteria. And under criteria, things we're hearing are definitions, legitimacy, having a proven record, in the case of uh, the Industry Association uh, convening the IGF in India, uh, gender, in the case of um, what Andriat had mentioned, and also ICC ba basis in terms of selection of representatives of the business constituency, geographical distribution, and uh, really excellent to hear youth. And then, of course, the other thread is in, in terms of accountability. The three uh, things that I heard under accountability. One is the selector, who is making the selection. And here we heard uh, two different models. There's one where there's a sole selector. And under that, we're hearing um, issues of credibility in the case of ICC basis, where the community trusts that uh, ICC basis is, is content and capable of making the selection. And on the other hand, you have, in, uh, you have other models where it's the MEG or NAMCOM or an aggregator that makes the selection. And the, the third thing that I heard under accountability from the panelists is the issue of productivity and the uh, capacity to remove them if they're not uh, performing in terms of accountability. So here we're hearing two throngs uh, of, uh, in terms of not only the selection, but also uh, productivity and that sort of thing. So with that, uh, I'm just going to very quickly ask any of the panelists if they want to quickly comment to any of the other uh, speakers, uh, fellow speakers' uh, comments, and then we'll open the floor and I'll ask the panelists to keep it brief. I uh, just a very short couple of points which I observed about. One is that um, none of the voluntary funding organizations were given any privileges in the running of the MAG or the sessions. They had no session, they had no chairs, they were not on the inaugural, they were not sort of out there, the brands were not shining all over the place. There was no such thing. And this was all private sector, and I said they had the least. And many of the issues that were discussed in the sessions were actually against the performance or the interest, as you would call, for those who had funded the businesses. So it was a, the, the accountability and the strength of the process came from the fact that nobody was told you can't do this session or you can't hold this session or you can't invite any speaker of your choice to any session that you want. And several of them were paid for because they were civil society and academia had to fly from outside Delhi, so they were, you know, they were funded for that travel. That's how we strengthened the process of multi-stakeholderism, because fund we shouldn't forget the importance of funding by ensuring inclusive participation of those who may not have the funds but may have great stuff to say in the conference. Thank you, Sarah. I just wanted to clarify that, so we're very clear, it's the membership that prioritizes, not the ICC basis secretariat. No, I just wanted to make sure because I didn't want to be um, misunderstood. It's really the membership that votes, quote unquote, on who should be selected or proposed. Thank you. 
Yeah, Veralt is an example who's on the CSTD working group on enhanced cooperation through this process. I have, I have, no, I have no idea how I got the words, but I was voted in. <laughs> so the, the correct word that I should have used was facilitator. Exactly. Facilitating the process. So I'm going to give this to George. And then um, I want to take off on something Henriette said. Uh, some of the criteria that she mentioned, ability to travel, to stick with things, to put the time in, and so on. I guess we assumed it. I didn't mention it, and Constance didn't mention it, but we assume that's a requirement, and uh, maybe we should state it as, uh, as being important, uh, important because uh, certainly it le leads to better results. Uh, but Emily, that point up the, brought up the point of uh, if somebody's not performing, uh, you ought to be able to replace them. Uh, and that relates to the performance issue. If, uh, uh, and, uh, it's very difficult to make judgments in some cases about how your representatives are performing on, uh, uh, on external bodies. Sometimes it's easier, uh, and I think that she raised a very good point. Uh, there is, uh, there's another point, and that is that uh, we, we list these desiderata, uh, but there are times when, uh, uh, when they conflict. And you can't get one without getting less of the other. And in particular, uh, in the technical community, uh, it's conceivable, um, uh, and probably does happen, that uh, uh, relevant experience, that is the technical experience, and independence may clash. Because often, the uh, people who know the most about a subject are the people who have been working in the field intensively. And therefore, uh, they may not be independent. They may be working for a firm that might stand to benefit uh, from their um, uh, their uh, uh, involvement. Uh, now, the typical way around this is uh, to let sunlight in. To uh, that uh, they declare you, you they uh, they declare their uh, conflicts, and if everybody knows what their conflicts are and they're trusted as an individual, then it's likely that the lack of independence uh, is not going to be uh, nearly so much of an issue and can be tolerated in some cases. Thank you. And um, thanks. I think we should recognize that different processes um, need different types of selection processes. So selecting someone for an opening ceremony speaking slot is very different from selecting somebody to work on a working group for a period of one or two years. Um, I think, just to react to Norbert, I think the idea of independence, I think it's actually really difficult to establish that. Um, a lot of civil society organizations work very closely with their governments. Um, I think it's good that they are transparent about that, but it doesn't mean that they are not legitimate civil society um, groups. So it, it makes it quite complex. Uh, complex. And as for being independent from business or this and that, then we get into a kind of thought police um, type of environment, you know, where, where you have to kind of check people's ideological purity, um, which is tricky and could just undermine cohesion even further. Then, and then I think just a back issue. I think one of the differences in, in efficiency and power, why does this echo when I speak, um, is because civil society lacks the opportunity to really work together on specific issues um, and to develop coherent responses, to do analysis, and, and then, and then um, pursue advocacy positions. Where they do that, you actually see them being quite effective in WIPO, for example, around the access to knowledge and access to development treaties. And you can also begin to see coalitions between civil society and governments and some sectors of business evolve. And I think whatever process we, we use, it needs to allow that to happen. Um, and then I think, uh, just another point, um, um, rotation versus con continuity, I think, is a real problem. I think we've ended up in, in, in the internet governance space with a process where it's almost as if people, everybody wants a turn um, to be a representative of civil society. And I'm not saying that's not legitimate, but if our goal is to pursue successful advocacy, I think expertise and continuity becomes very important. And I'm putting my APC hat on, Norbert, where's that hat? Um, and for a group like APC, on one hand, we... <laughs> Thanks. 
And we, we do a lot of advocacy and a lot of policy research and analysis. And it's very important for us. We are, we are, we tell, we, we use public funds. We, we raise donor funding to be able to pursue that advocacy. Um, and then we work very hard to have access to spaces. So we are often in a very awkward position because on the one hand, we want to have access to negotiating spaces and working groups because that's what we do. We work for that and we have goals and we have statements, they are transparent, they are available. But we don't represent all of civil society. We, we represent APC and APC members. So I, I sometimes think that a combination approach of a more traditional UN ECOSOC accredited approach, which gives certain space and access to um, civil society groups that do this work on, sorry, on an ongoing basis, combined with a, a non-com approach that gives more rotation and space for individuals and academics, um, might work. So I don't have all the answers, but I, I know that it's not easy. Thank you, Henriette. Very interesting uh, perspectives uh, from all the panelists. And it does beg the question whether there's need for some sort of accountability and transparency mechanism, uh, whether that's going to be, that would have to be formal or informal, or whether that's something that, um, that needs to be discussed or not. But anyway, we don't want to hear from me, we want to hear from you. So with that memo, we would like to invite the remote participants if they have any questions. And if there, if there are others, um, who would like to comment, we'd just like you to please come up near to the mic so that we can have seamless interaction and we'll take all your questions and then have the panel uh, address them. Mama? I don't have a mic. Is this the only mic? Thank you, Panesh. Um, we've had two people come off and online having difficulties connecting someone called Uta and some other person called Sean. But I don't have their input for now. But um, my, this is my personal input, no hearts on, just the scarf. Um, it's about um, the, the civil society, because that's what many people online are also talking about on Twitter. That complicated stakeholder that um, cannot decide very easily, uh, cannot organize very efficiently, and cannot seem to agree on anything. And my question to the panelists will be, that though they cannot get things out very easily, um, the gentleman from India did recognize that it was the civil society that brought the real issues to the table. So my question would be, is it because in activism, we've had a long, traditional, a long tradition of being mobilized against. In, as activists, we normally we are either for or against. And so that has been our reason that the way we do things. Okay, we don't like this, we all go against it. So we are always fighting for or fighting against. And when we get into multi, when we get into processes in which there is no clear for or against, then it becomes a problem because we are now forced into working with differences that exist within the civil society. Do you think that's correct? That's what I'm thinking now because I've been an activist for some years. I, both my parents were activists, and I was born this way. So it's not IGF's fault that I'm this way, okay? Right. Now, the thing is, we've always had things to fight for or fight against. But when we've come to IGF, there are no clear enemies and there are no clear friends, and we end up being our own enemies. Is that correct? We'll take another question. Pranesh? Um, yeah, uh, I, I think Constance uh, really hit the nail on the head when she uh, uh, 
showed the problem, highlighted the problem between self-representation and representation of others, right? Uh, that in ITF everyone comes in just for themselves. And, and I think that's a problem across the board, not just in the technical community. So uh, I have actually a few questions we have time. Uh, if we do, then, uh, then OK, I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, one question would be, uh, is IETF a uh, multi-stakeholder? If so, who are the stakeholders? And this is a uh, this is a issue that that kind of runs across the board, right? Uh, if you look at the uh, Internet Architecture Board, uh, there are a total of uh, 15 people. There are one or two academics, depending on how you count that. There are 13 businesses represented, one NGO represented, two women, and one person who is not Caucasian. Uh, so the question of representativeness, okay, if we move from just people who participate and are elected, etc., the question of representativeness, this kind of highlights. In the ISOC Board of Trustees, there's one person who's from a developing country. Uh, all, there, there are numerous people from the United States, on the other hand, uh, in civil society. Who is civil society? How do you exclude people from civil society? Do you decide on the basis of NGOs, individuals, non-profit com uh, uh, companies, or what? Where are the religious groups who are in, uh, important at national levels often? Where are the trade unions? Where are the environmentalist groups? I mean, it's a very small community that's actually engaging in, in this process. So, uh, and individuals, if they're always allowed to be part of civil society, who are they accountable to at the end of the day? I mean, at least for businesses, even if it's a small company, there is the question of accountability that's easier to answer. Okay, for tech community, there is not much of a question of accountability that so far they needed to answer. For civil society, the question of accountability exists and no one's done any answering. Okay, and, and so, uh, and Norbert mentioned best bits. How many people, as a, as a rising star, right? How many people on best bits are different from the people who are on IGC? So uh, has there been any attempt at, at creating a difference? I think it's a different platform, sure. But in terms of representation, there is nothing different about it. In fact, it represents a smaller group. So a smaller subset of IGC. Yeah, this is more like a comment and uh, could also be a question. I'm really interested in the issue of independence. And uh, I'm interested in it because I look at um, civil society working with government as panning out in two different scenarios. One, if you're an agent of the government, because in many countries where democracies may not be mature, then there are NGOs that are set up, or civil society, so-called civil society set up by government. And in that case, you know, they might infiltrate, quote-unquote, political civil society. Political civil society which is independent. The second scenario is that in traditional theories of politics, there is the state and then there is political civil society. And within a democracy, of course, this ideal public sphere doesn't exist anywhere. But the, um, the hope is that somebody will speak on behalf or some set of organizations will speak on behalf of people as in d democracy, demo I mean people, and that those voices can then actually be part of the political process and can percolate into public policy. So for me, even the UN started co-opting individuals, you know, to, um, that was about 10-15 uh, years ago, even the World Bank did. For me, the process of working with institutions retaining their independence is very different from working as agents of government. So I want to make that clarification, just adding to uh, what Andrew said, you know, about even people who are very closely with government. Of course, you have to. I have, in, in a country like India, I believe that uh, the Right to Education Act, the Right to Food Bill, which is being debated in Parliament, um, and uh, you know, we're not oh, yes. Sorry, because of uh, the brief time, and we'd like lots of people to ask, could you distill it and ask your question, frame your question? Yeah, so for comments, let me just finish it. I won't take long. So I think that this question of independence uh, and people working with government should not be conflated. I think they are different. Secondly, I think uh, independence from uh, independence with respect to who is funding you is a very important question. 
And I think that a lot has been written about it in India, particularly over the past, let's say, 60 years as to how the NGO movement has changed. And there are certainly implications of that for what the panel has been discussing is the final outcomes or accountability. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, if we could just uh, thank you, Anita. Maybe we'll use that mic. Uh, Mike, if we could have you ask your question. Is there anyone after Mike? Mima, are there any? In the just before, yes, go ahead, Mike. Uh, I think it's more in the form of a comment than a question. Um, I think the processes we're involved in are really quite important. Uh, when we talk about um, selection, when we talk about the role of civil society, or I'm sorry, the role of the stakeholders, uh, given the discussion that was held in this room immediately prior, uh, we're talking about at least the future of the internet uh, within a multi-stakeholder environment. Uh, the problem that I have is that the multi-stakeholder environment, as I said in the, another session today, is based on the notion of consensus and uh, a commonality of norms. There's a normative consensus, an assumption of a normative consensus within each of the stakeholder groups. And I think, um, uh, I certainly I've heard that uh, explicitly in the uh, technical community, implicitly in the business community, and I think uh, uh, with a, 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 an exception from the uh, civil society where uh, Henriette did recognize that there was divergence. I think that that's a very dangerous thing, uh, is the assumption of consensus. Uh, because in the absence of means to recognize and accommodate divergence, uh, divergence of opinion, divergence of uh, position, divergence of interest, uh, conflict, uh, then I think what we're talking about is a, uh, a managed, undemocratic system. Uh, one, of the, one of the strong points of democracy is that it has methods for, for organizing and managing conflict. The kind of multi-stakeholder model that is being presented here and that's being discussed without definition yesterday and today uh, is not one that seems to either accommodate or recognize or have any means of, of managing and responding to divergence and conflict. And uh, I think that I, I'd like to hear some response to that, how, how that's handled. I should say that in, in civil society there's there are some mechanisms for, for dealing with that, and that's part of the, the, I guess, the incoherence of civil society. But I, I'd like to hear that. Uh, I'd like to hear that on two levels. One, one which is, has to do with the overall multi-stakeholder model uh, and the issue of conflict uh, within the, uh, the conflict in relation to the stakeholder structures. And secondly, uh, conflict in relation to the individual stakeholder elements, individual elements of stakeholder, other stakeholders. Thank you, Mike. I'd just like to uh, say that um, we'd like to thank everybody who's been giving feedback from the floor and also raising questions, because you've added four things to uh, the criteria that's been building up by the panel. Uh, Nana raised the issue of uh, culture. Anita raised the issue of independence. And uh, Mike raised the issue of uh, democratization and legitimacy. There is another question, and straight after that question, uh, it's asked I'm going to get the panel and we'll start with Aisha first. Do you have a mic? Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Emma from Paris, and I just have a comment on, general comment on everything that was kind of said in his the final comment kind of roused my interest. And he says, from what I understood, that the current model of selecting individuals to represent each stakeholder group in the current intergovernment, um, uh, internet governance model isn't really democratic. But in that sense, what really is a democracy? Because to have a democracy, you have to have the representation of all the interests. 
And how do you represent the interests if not by having a specialized person who, who best knows and understands the questions at stake and can designate a, rep a representative to speak for each of these communities? And it also needs um, um, my friend, what she said on um, the fact that we are civil society is its own enemy, that civil society is so large and um, so vast that it, it has a really hard time trying to conciliate all the different interests. And I think, I think finding a better process to designate people who can represent the interests would make the process more democratic because it would give a stronger role and strengthen the role of each person. So contrary to what the previous person said, I think that the selection process makes internet governance more democratic rather, rather than making it less democratic, but that's just my independent and personal point of view. No cap on. Okay. One, one feedback from remote Yemeni. Yeah, Someone called Elmila Boucher said she wants to see the photos of people when they wear their hats on. So please don't put down the hat and take it off. I need to take your pictures and make a, a photo album of the heart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nana. Aisha. That's because you want to make fun of me. I have yours. Don't do it. Thank <laughs> you, Sarah. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, so please okay. come in. So, uh, very briefly to respond to the divergence conflict uh, consensus point that was made, just wanted to clarify within the ICC basis business community, um, actually we don't build any policy positions through the basis group. All of our business policy positions are uh, developed through a rigorous consensus building process within ICC's Digital Economy Commission. So by the time you take the issues that the basis initiative is uh, trying to contribute to, um, we have a solid base of policy positions and the rest is really more uh, positioning uh, political issues or uh, decisions on process. And there, what we find is that the diverse sectors and geographically different businesses have common interests and it's really not that difficult a problem. Within the MAG, I would say, having been there since the inception, um, there are moments of conflict there is a, a, an effort made by different people to facilitate, to find some way in which we can all be comfortable. And I think that that's, that's a good thing, and we all have been learning through that process, through the, different, the disagreements. I think all stakeholder groups over the years learn more about not only substance, but procedural um, perspectives of the various stakeholder groups. I hope that's responsive. I wanted to respond to the first point that was made about, um, about my observation of civil society on the whole issue of for and against. So I think there are, my experience is about 11 months dealing with civil society on a, on a sort of regular basis uh, on the issues of internet governance in India uh, to arrange these issues. So here are my uh, sort of experiences of this extensive dialogue which is relatively short. Three reasons why I think one is the fact that their DNA is for and against as they get out of their bed every morning. That is what they do. That's an important thing for them. You can't take that away. Uh, just as you know, businesses will go make money. That's what they do. You can't. The governments will do. You know, write laws. That's what they do. And students will go get to the college. So you know, that's their DNA. You can't take that away, however hard you try. Second, I think there are genuine differences in the civil society. Uh, between the positions that they take, there are civil societies that believe that the government should be given a bigger role, there are civil societies that believe government should be given, given a bigger role, there are those who believe surveillance is critical because it's important for national security and that's their part of the mandate and there are others who are fighting for free speech. So actually, within the whole issue of cyber security, there are two sets of civil society, one fighting harder for national security, one fighting harder for um, um, you know, less the surveillance. So there are genuine differences in position. And the third part that I would say is actually, uh, this is my experience with the most relevant one, which is I don't think they are trained professionally to work with each other uh, and work in coalitions as much as the businesses are. 
businesses have to get themselves into a room and have no choice but to find a way forward to the to the point about manufacturing consensus. You cannot leave the room unless you leave your minor differences on the side and find a way forward by sacrificing your absolutist agenda. Businesses are trained to do that. Academicians are trained to do that because of the uh, academic politics that goes on in colleges and institutions. Um, I, I think the technical community is very trained to do that, ITF for example. Even the youth, as I said. So I think there are three, three of these reasons. So, you know, they are for and against, there are genuine differences, but also uh, I think um, other, the other stakeholders regularly work together in coalitions as industry associations where they are mandated to find a way to leave extremist positions and move forward. And, and to your point, sir, just the one point I wanted to make to the last comment that you made about um, consensus building, that the difficulty is that at some stage, even in a democracy, you've got to move forward. And so people must sacrifice their absolute agenda. We often do, uh, and everybody will have to do that. And that's the only way they will have to move. And that won't be, I don't think that constitutes um, manufacturing consensus, but that's sort of come making common ground or what's popular in India as a common minimum program. Thank you. Andre, would you like to respond? Um, thanks. Maybe that sounds better. Maybe there's no difference. And um, thanks um, for the opportunity. I must say um, I have seen companies disagree with one another violently, um, particularly the, the careers and the, and, the, and the internet companies. But, I, but I've also seen, as you say, you know, for example, taking the OECD as, a, as an example, that they do, um, I wouldn't say they, they, they necessarily reach consensus um, easily, but there is an agreement that consensus um, is more strategic in the end than division, but I, but I don't think we should underestimate the differences um, right. among, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think good ideas have come up, just a few reactions. I think we should approach this process by process. I think different types of processes, different types of um, policy making institutions um, lend themselves to different modalities for non-governmental stakeholder participation. Um, I think on the issue of independence, I think it's important, but I think it's very difficult to establish, and I think the process of establish it, establishing it could be very divisive. I think transparency, on the other hand, is not difficult, and I think it is important for any publicly uh, engaged institution to be transparent about how it's financed, and also to make its positions and, and its values available. Um, but to decide who is truly independent and who is not will just result in witch hunting. Um, in my view, within civil society. Um, I think the issue of representativity, pernicious questions, that is the hardest question to answer, and I think civil society is very rarely representative. I personally believe civil society cannot claim to be representative. It can claim to have expertise, it can claim to have consulted with a particular community, if a dam is being built in a village, and a civil society organization has done research and talked with that community, they can represent that community's interest. But it has to be assessed on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And then finally, just to mention the example of when I think a specific case can result in a very good process, is within the OECD, um, there is a civil society structure called CSAC, um, and as Miriam is here, and, and that structure has a membership of about 80 individuals and organizations and a steering committee. And when we have the opportunity to, to submit comp, um, comments or represent civil society, we draw from among our membership those who have the expertise and the time to submit comment and content or negotiate. And actually, we've always managed to reach consensus. And um, that process, which is a more structured, traditional process, civil society group, elected steering committee, trusted among its peers, and, and then expert knowledge-based input works quite well. Thank you, Henriette. If we could have a question from the remote participant, Pranesh, I'm going to ask for your assistance. And uh, Norbert? Yeah. 
We don't really have time for um, uh, the question. And then, uh, yeah. I'm afraid no, it's a question. It's not a question. Sure. It's just a statement from sure. Angelina, sure. who says it is because in capitals, civil society is diverse, complex, and messy that it is able to raise issues that no one else does. That's excellent, and that's a very good comment to conclude this uh, workshop. And with that, thank you for turning up. For those who are interested in um, workshop 210, you can talk to George about it outside the, in the corridor. And um, this workshop is officially concluded. Thank you, everyone. And just as I mentioned earlier, there will be a draft text. And if you're interested in participating, please leave your business cards up here. Thank you. I understand there's a drop text of what? Uh, we'll be consolidating the discussion. Ah, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.